Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Despite Labor Day, uh, you who are here, despite Labor Day, uh, to uh, the talk today. Uh, the talk today is uh, on a, uh, a topic that is uh, uh, near and dear to uh, all of us, which is uh, Internet resources and make, making them uh, less, uh, depending on uh, the uh, lack of uh, attacks, so we want to make them more secure. Uh, at the same time, uh, we want to improve servers and, uh, and improve the Internet. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome Mina, who is uh, going to tell us about one uh, attack that can be uh, used that's new, uh, that exploits uh, the behavior, the control behavior of some routing and uh, server elements in the network. Uh, Mina is a PhD student at Boston University. He is uh, uh, working on uh, network-related security, traffic management, uh, and uh, quality of service. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the microphone. So current denial of service attacks uh, are carried, currently are carried through subjecting the system to a very high load. So if you want to take a bridge down, for example, you will sustain this bridge to a high load, bring big elephants to stand on the bridge. So you deny service for all legitimate users. And current denial of service attacks actually bring bad news to everybody, not just the users who get the denial of service, but actually for, think about ISPs, uh, network ad administrators and network operators uh, and for example the recent attack of Maidun had cost the economy billions of dollars so despite all these bad news there's actually some good news and the good news is that it takes a lot of resources to mount such an attack you have to recruit the elephant you have to bring it onto the bridge uh, something that's very hard and the second good news is that it's easy to determine that the resource is under attack so once you see elephants on the bridge, you can tell that there's an attack. And theoretically, you can trace back preparators. So if you want to find out who did this attack, you better find out who owns the elephant or who can rent these elephants or how did they come onto the bridge. So what if it does not take a lot of resources to mount an attack? So there's no big elephants involved. And what if it's very hard to determine that the resource is under attack? So basically, you look there and all you can see on the bridge is just the gridlock, something that happens on rush hour. Uh, and since you cannot determine that uh, the resource is under attack, it's very hard to trace back, because you, uh, uh, you will not know that there's an attack. Uh, this is achieved because the attack's goal is not necessary to cause the huge damage to the bridge, but rather than, you know, just a small gridlock by these crappy cars or students on bikes or something like this. Uh, so the attack goal is a reduction of quality and reduction of liability, like rock and roll. So let me introduce rock attacks. What do you mean by liability? Uh, liability that the system, if you, it's liability or reliability. So uh, if, if you're expecting some service from this bridge, for example, then having, you know, Gridlocks all the time, you, you, you have decreased your liability. 
Uh, please feel free to interrupt me anytime with any questions. Uh, so rock attacks, the basic idea is that we want to hijack as much capacity as we can. And the goal here is we have to do this with minimal exposure. So we don't want to show, we don't want to behave in a way that would make us uh, susceptible to being, uh, we're doing an attack. And how are we going to do this? We're going to exploit uh, built-in adaptation mechanisms that are currently employed everywhere. And it's good to think about, you know, we want to keep the, as an attacker, I'll be wearing my attacker hat today for the rest of this talk, so what you want to do is you want to have the system in transient behavior all the time. Or hopefully you can cause it to be unstable. Uh, so if you think about driving on the bridge, well, how you make uh, uh, drivers accelerate when they should brake or brake when they should accelerate. So let me define the goal more clearly. What I mean by minimal exposure. So rock attacks maximize the marginal utility of attack traffic. So we define a metric called the potency. The potency describes the damage per cost. So for example, if you think about if you flood an internet link, let's say this internet link is 100 megabits per second. If an attacker floods this link at a rate of 100 megabits per second, well sure, he caused the damage of 100 megabits per second, but he invested 100 megabits per second to cause this attack. So the potency is one. So what we're more interested in is attacks that aim to maximize, as it says here, the marginal utility of attack traffic. If I can inject 10 megabits per second and cause damage for 100 megabits per second, then I have a potency of 10. And that's my goal. And throughout this work, we're going to uh, use different instantiations for damage and cost. You can think about damage as rejected request for a web server. You think about increasing response time, wasted bandwidth. And the same thing, you can think about different costs for mounting the attack, how many attackers you need, uh, how much traffic you inject to the network. And we're going to introduce this parameter omega uh, to model the aggressiveness of attack. So if you have a large omega, this means that this is the largest level of aggression, because 1 over omega would be equal to 0, and you're interested in maximizing the damage. So denial of service attacks are actually uh, can be characterized as rock attacks with a very large omega. If you have a small omega, then basically you're, you want to keep a low profile. You want to have the minimum exposure possible. What? Rather than? than say a, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the yeah, you, you can model it different ways. We just chose to. Yeah, you can model it different ways. It doesn't have to be. Uh, Does that affect your uh, well, it, it depends, but you can have. You can use like one over omega. Call it to pi, for example, or something else, and this would switch. Large omega would be. It's just that. No, I mean, bringing it down from the power. The cost to the power one over omega is multiplied. Uh, multiplied by omega. Perhaps. Uh, sure, yeah, or one over omega. You can do that, yeah. There's not... I guess the cost is uh, in the log scale. Yeah. That's what I'm driving at. Uh, is there an algorithmic... No. Okay, no. So, how rock attacks is going to target the adaptation mechanism? If you think about any adaptation mechanism, it's trying to drive the system into a nice region. And usually, uh, this happens through increase and decrease rules. So, for example, if you have, if X of R uh, describes the rate of a connection, then you can think about uh, rec, uh, X, the, the change in XR is based on an increase function and a decrease function. And at steady state, these two equations, uh, the, the change in the rate will be equal to zero, and then you drive the steady state, uh, the steady state rate. However, these increase and decrease rules depend on uh, another function called P or price. And these prices is actually the congestion that this connection sees along when gets bad. So, for example, a TCP connection, when there's a loss, it decreases its rate. When there's no loss, it increases its rate linearly. Uh, so these prices affect how the connection change or adapts. But, but it increases yeah. as you go to more packets, the exponential right? Right, exactly. It increases now. Right. Exactly. 
is that why you're modeling both? Yeah, are the functions being modeled differently? Uh, we, we're gonna, this is just a general model that's saying that there's increased rules and decreased rules. Uh, we're going to go into more details where we show the AIMD specifically for TCP. Okay. But for now, it's, uh, this is just to show that how things adapt or how the connections adapt. And the, the, the goal for rock attacks is to disturb these prices or the congestion signals that they are fed back to the connection. And uh, we want to keep the system in transit all the time. So whenever the system is about to stabilize, we knock it off through changing these prices. And this process repeats. And the reason uh, adaptation. Sorry. Yeah. If I drop, if I force dropping packets on us, if I go in front of the server mm -hmm. and drop packets, you're saying this is a very minimal cost, uh, but the, the, the installing is quite bad. Uh, for specific, for TCP connections, any losses is, is, is any exogenous loss or independent loss from congestion. This key will act by having its window. So these losses actually are, so that's why TCP connection behavior on wireless connections are, are not as good because these wireless are inter interpreted by the, the source as congestion. So they react by decreasing the rate, for example. Yeah, but the thing is, see, the, the bridge story is very different. You're saying take this car or the connection, Right. And throw it away and put it in the lake, right? But the rest of the cars only perceive that as freedom and they move more, more fast. Like if you throw, right. a, throw away a connection, that bandwidth gets shared by other people. Correct. So no, no. it wouldn't cost anything yet by throwing something off a decent connection, right? Yeah. But so, so these effects will, will target all the connections on the link. So I'm going to target all the flows. Right. Uh, that's what I want to see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. TCP, in some sense, is not one that will affect everything. Right. So let's let's leave this question to the next part of the talk. I'm going to talk specifically on TCP. I'll I'll do more here. Uh, so the adaptation mechanisms are built in under assumption that uh, you know personal arrivals or random arrivals, and the question is how much adversary can these loads come to cause adaptation to be harmful? And I'm going to consider two examples for this talk. Uh, the first part is admission controllers and uh, for, for web servers. It doesn't have to be for web servers. It could be for database servers. Uh, so the victim here is an admission controller. And then for the next part of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk about congestion control uh, in networks. So the admission control is basically the gate that protects uh, whatever is behind, whether it's a web server or a database server, uh, from overload conditions. So basically a request comes, whether it's admit, you can cross the bridge, or it's going to be rejected, or it could be postponed. But I will not worry about postponing now request. Uh, let's think about it for admission or rejection. So the admission control adaptation relies on an admission controller. The admission controller decides what percentage of requests should I admit to the system right now. And this is usually calculated based on the deviation between some server state and some target state. So based on this deviation or the error signal, you increase or decrease your admission ratio. And you can use the PI controller, which is a proportion integral controller, or you can use AI and D controller to model the uh, admission controller. What's AI? Uh, AI and D additive increase, multiplicative decrease. So, for example, you can have a controller that, when everything's fine, is going to increase the admission ratio, but at the linear rate. But whenever this congestion is going ex exactly, yeah. Uh, there's also a feedback monitor, which would measure the surface state uh, and reports this back to the controller. And usually feedback monitors are associated with feedback delay. Uh, this could be to physical delay or maybe due to averaging or uh, some. So if, if we look at the admission control adaptation block diagram, uh, so here is the admission controller. Decides how many requests are admitted. Uh, the admitted requests will go to the server. Some of them will leave, uh, and the server will incur some utilization. This utilization will be fed back. Uh, to the controller, and based on the error signal between uh, the, the current utilization and target utilization, you're going to adjust your admission ratio. So one can describe uh, this model in discrete time. So if you think about time divided into steps, you can say at the, you can model a PI controller with 
the admission ratio alpha i, at time i is basically uh, some constant k multiplied by the error signal between target utilization row and the current utilization plus alpha i minus 1. This is the admission ratio at the previous time step. So if, if current utilization is equal to the target utilization, basically your alpha i is equal to alpha i minus 1, and this is a stable condition. Uh, what says this is stable? Oh, some diverge. I'm sorry? No, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that if, if, if these two are the same, if these two are equal, if, if always your utilization is equal to your target utilization. That still doesn't say that you're already not divergent at all from I1 as well. You can model it this way, but the thing is, there is also the fact that you have you want to go to a Poisson state and you observe the state, right? Yeah. This says that this is purely based on the, the temporal. Uh, you know, thing saying there is no bound on where alpha i can be. Then there needs to be some central point where alpha is trying to converge, right? Uh, 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 this is just the first part of the model. Uh, let me model the rest of the block. The blocks. This is just target state is uh, raw star. Right? Raw star is the target utilization. The target state. So you want to get yeah. that certain utilization. So based on the current utilization, you increase or decrease the emission ratio. So if, you, if your utilization, is target utilization is, for example, 90%, and you currently have utilization of 80%, so you better open up your admission ratio a little bit. Okay? Until you hit one. I would, I would assume Rho is a, is a multi-dimensional thing, right? Uh, it, it's itself as a function of it could be, any yes, powder. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's it could be. It's seen. Absolutely. And we do admission control. Right, it could be something related to memory, CPU, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But for, yes. for the purpose of this stuff, I'm just using utilization as some metric. And in the experiments, I'm going to give this as memory utilization, for example. Uh, There's like a single resource, bottleneck against a single resource. Okay. Right, yes. So the number of admitted requests, M of i, is wherever arrival rate of lambda i multiplied by the alpha i. This is your admission ratio. So the server, the total number of requests inside the server at any instance of time, n i, is equal to whatever was before, we didn't finish, plus whoever was admitted at time i, plus what, minus whoever left at time minus one. And we're going to model the server uh, using these two functions. I didn't write the equations because I think the, the plots will make more clear, more clear. So for example here, uh, depending on n i, you're going to have some utilization. So, uh, for example, when n equals zero, there is 0.2 utilization. This could be the background process or something like this. And as n increases, you're going to uh, increase linearly. And then there's a point where you're going to increase with different slope. And this is the target utilization you want to operate at. On the other hand, depending on the utilization, the service rate changes. So, for example, this is the maximum service rate you can, uh, you can, your server can, can uh, operate at. And if utilization exceeds some value, you're going to have a decline. This is like crashing. The server is overloaded and the service rate would decrease. And we call this crashing init, which describes the service. How is that a flat line initially? This one? And uh, why is that a flat line? Uh, this is the maximum utilization. This so, utilization versus what? Uh, utilization versus service rate. So what's this saying is that if, the if you're operating in a nice region, your service rate is maximized. You can process requests as much as 90 requests per second. Right? But if, you, if your utilization is very high, you, your service rate will start decreasing. Oh, which one of the curves is that? This is the, the peak of the curve extended to the left. This is the capacity. Service rate here is the capacity. This is the characteristic. He's, of the, he's of talking the about the ideal place, right? Which we claim was the you, Right. So if the, if the vertical axis was throughput, then it would, it would go up linearly with the utilization until it hits the peak and drop. Right. right. So what's the y-axis here? I don't understand that. Uh, here? Service rate, you're saying, right? Service rate, yeah. Capacity rate. 
No, it's clearer if it's true. If you no, it's true. Right. So you're saying a beyond a point capacity form. Exactly. That's what yes. you're saying. Yes, yes. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at drop attack premise. So if, if think about an attacker sending uh, request at a very high rate for a very short time, and after this the attacker will shut off. What's going to happen is that since you're admitting some percentage, a lot of requests will go inside the system. And since this number is going to be very high, the server is going to operate in an inefficient region, where it's basically trash. I would have burst here. Right? Yeah, this is a burst of packets coming in a very short time. Uh, this is not necessarily from one client or one attack. Exactly. It could be from multiple clients. Uh, and what was, what's going to happen is that the admission, ratio, admission controller is going to shut off subsequent re requests because utilization now is very high. The controller will react by reducing the admission ratio. And once the admission ratio goes down, that's not admitting any requests or a few requests, uh, only then it will start open up again. And when this happens, when the system recovers, the attacker is going to uh, strike back again. So hold on, hold on. Sure. Yeah. Now, if you send this on a system without admission control, yeah. Oh, so, it's, so you're saying that this happens because admission control, there's the there's feedback delay. Yeah. In the real system, there is no feedback delay. Okay. So if the if the the new requests are not shut off, that what you say? Yeah. The, the attack is on admission controller. First of all. But I'm saying uh, I didn't I didn't introduce the feedback delay. Feedback delay would uh, in this model there is no feedback delay. Hey, I understand. Okay. What what is this? How is this? So you're saying a system with admission control does this, right? Right. What is, what is a regular system with without admission control? Which escapes all of this. It does not shut. Uh, it's not going to shut. It does not shut other servers. Okay. I mean, yes. Requests to, from coming in. Yes. Right? You're saying that you would require a large number of attackers to actually do denial of service on a traditional system. Where here, you're going to push. I'm, I'm targeting the admission, the adaptation in the admission controller. So if there's no admission contro controller that's trying to adapt, then maybe you shouldn't use like rock attacks or. And then are you going to compare the behavior under rock attack okay. of the system with and without admission control? No. Okay, that would be useful to have the comparison. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I would know because a system would just send other things in, mm -hmm. it might suffer, but it will eventually get out of it. And you're saying admission control will shut things off. But that's all. that also depends on whether you're. It's at, uh, well, it all depends on the feedback delay too. Okay. It will depend on the feedback delay, that's true. And you have to be, able, the attacker has to be able to infer the feedback delay, otherwise the attack is useless. The other thing that I'm curious about is that you, you show this point where the utilization goes up, the system starts thrashing. And here you're saying that you're going to push utilization by a very high request rate. But is that is that a, an equal translation? I mean, are, how can a small number of people generate enough requests to actually push utilization? Well, think about this. The admission control is saying, for example, uh, I'm admitting now 90%, and that's the normal rate. Imagine a point in time where I, as an attacker, I inject 1,000 requests. So what's going to happen is that you're going to admit 900 of these 1,000. Because you also know the rate at which you've been throwing things out. Admission control also looks at the rate, the throughput that's been achieved at 90%. I mean, if you're saying 90%, that 90% means 90% of something, right? And you throw a, let's say, a, 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 a burst. Right. It's going to evaluate the burst unless he doesn't know anything, right? It's going to cap it off at 90% of the, of not the burst, but the throughput that it's been seen. So you're telling us there's a percentage of traffic that's allowed You can't send all these people in. The resolution control won't send it in. Why? The admission controller is just describing the percentage of requests that I should admit in, at any point in time. Percentage of what? A percentage oh, right. of... Number of requests. Yes. The request that it has sent out already, right? The throughput that it has been able to achieve. Percent of what? Percent of what? Maybe if you should show the result, we can have a concrete uh, behavior to refer to. Okay. Then, I mean, then we can admission check. control, if it were to look at arrivals only, it wouldn't be admission control, right? It, it, this is how this is how I assume the model. 
effect. So this is the attack pattern. You inject power request at rate delta for half points in time, and you sleep for T minus tau. Yeah. Okay. So we we instantiate this model, and these are numerical results. So at, at this time, at this point in time, I inject a lot of requests. So what's going to happen is that the utilization. So this is. Uh, on the y-axis from 0 to 1 I'm describing both the admission ratio and the utilization and on the x-axis it's time and at this point in time I, in I inject my burst so what's going to happen is that utilization will go high since utilization is operating at 1 the admission controller will start decreasing closing its gates to the requests so what's going to happen is that it's going to start declining until a point in time where the system has recovered so it's going to start to open up again its gates but linearly but linearly so and until it goes back to this at this point the attack repeats so here I'm showing uh, one of these persons what's going to happen this here what's the red line? the red line is the admission rate, rate. ratio admission ratio Okay, so dip this depends on D, right? It depends. Yeah, it depends on D and depends on K. Like it depends on K. The K so K, the, con the PI controller, the constant plays an important part. Yeah. If you have a high K, this means that you can recover quickly. If you have a lower K, you can recover slower. I'm going to talk about K in particular. So, so what we're interested in is computing the the damage. So, we instantiate the potency metric as the number of requests you rejected during this effort. Remember, there's no more arrivals coming, and you reject some of them because your admission ratio uh, divided by how much I inject. So, this depends on K. So, what I'm showing here on the x-axis is K, and on the y-axis is the potency. And you can see here, for example, for this point, for example, it's around 20 or uh, 25. So this means that for a single request that I inject, I would cost 25 of rejected requests. So let's look at this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the first graph. If first one. Yeah, first okay. graph. Now, if the first graph would not, see, this, this assumes you know, the maximum rate that you're able to achieve here, the maximum damage you're able to achieve here depends on the fact that the, that the attack comes um, as soon as the system recovers to its previous state. Right. So you have to know right. yes. that's, that's yes. exactly the, that's related to D. And uh, D meaning the feedback loop, right? Okay. The admitting, the falling, and then the coming back is related to D. Yeah. Right? And also the linear it, it depends on all rough. It also depends on the ninety percent first that you're sending. I mean, correct. Yeah, yeah. There is a problem with. This is just an instantiation. Right, right, right. Yeah. But I'm saying there's a problem with you assuming that I would be able to the admission control controller would send in ninety percent of the first because then the admission controller normally does not send that. It, it takes the current throughput and it says, okay, I can expect to go up to 90% on a scale of the throughput, not the burst, because the burst would be very different. There is queuing stages all over the place, right? So you kind of know, know, but even assuming that you go, let's go further, right? Even then you need to know what the, you need to calculate the, the, the recovery time of the system and plan this appropriately. Right? I mean, you have to have a lot of models placed to be able to do that. That's true. We're going to talk later about online controllers that will do this, online attack. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that the key observation is that if you have any admission control, no matter how the algorithm works, so long as this admission controller rejects any requests at all, if you can make it reject even one request, then you already won that rejection. So the attacker wants to cause these rejections. Yeah, but then it's yeah, putting a lot of this. That's right. It wants to start one. It's below one. That's right. On the other hand, also, right? on the other hand, if you didn't have any admission control, so therefore there's no rejection, then the attacker would have to apply a burst big enough to overflow the buffers in the, in the server yeah. before the rejections can happen. But it can, for this small burst, still affect the response time. Whereas, 
without admission control, it affects more than just one side because of the injection. Uh, and the key observation. That's one thing, but the main thing is that the reason the reason we're getting this high potency, like for example 100, is because that the attacker is smart because it pushed the server into overload and then back off. Once it back off, it, it decreases its rate, so you don't have to plot the servers constant. I think there's a period of time where you're still doing damage and not, you, and you have no input. There's no cost to you, but you're still producing damage. So, so right. this is saying you really don't have to provide an integral load, you just have to differentiate from produce spikes. That's all you're saying. Produce spikes in the system large enough so that the system does not recover. After it's recovered, produce another spike. Exactly. And, and you've, got, you've gotten the same effect as loading it on a constant basis. It's not the same effect. Well, it's the same effect meaning as far as being found out, this is better. Spikes are better. You won't ever be able to, nobody will be able to find you out. Exactly. That, that's the but, the... but the faster that the server responds, the lower the damage that you do, right? Uh, that's the D. That's the D. Right? The faster the server fast, responds... Like, sure, yes. If there's, if, but the problem is that if the server responds very quickly, uh, it could respond to, you know, uh, traffic that is not really from an attacker, it's just normal traffic that is a little bit changing. So you don't want to have this. So there's a compromise here, which I'll, I'll outline. There's a trade-off, which is important. Uh, so we use an implementation setup. So we have a server. The server is running a uh, mini HTTP. And basically, when a request arrives to the server, the server is going to fork a CGI script. Uh, CGI access one megabit uh, memory. And it takes around 20 milliseconds to handle this request. And we use four clients. Uh, we use actually perf to generate these uh, uh, requests, and we uh, in, uh, uh, use memory utilization as, as, as utilization for the system, which is use memory over total memory. So this is the experiments we had. So uh, this is the before the attack. The memory is operating here at this point in time. I start the attack. You can see that the memory utilization shoots up. And consequently, the admission ratio will go down. So what, did you did you design the admission controller here? Yes, we we added the admission control. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, we added the admission control in front of the support system. Okay. And uh, we use the same rules, so the same PI controller, and you can see that the admission uh, rate is going to go down and then go up again. And this type of request. And the question is how, how many requests did we reject and how many requests did we inject? What, what's the rate? What's the potency? So, well, we said that the potency will depend on K. So we can get up to 8. So for every request I inject, I cause denial of service for 8 requests. Of course, there is a big difference between the assuming assume, Assuming the, 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 the rate, right? You're saying since my system went down and came back up, the yeah. area under the curve says that you can get up to one eighth of, I mean, you can throw away, what? Uh, you can throw away an eighth of the area, something like that. Uh, the area, the, the, the area on the top part, right? Right. You know, the, the, the V yeah. that you throw. Okay. That's the, the area is where you're not, where you're throwing away. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. So you're comparing again. You're taking that area and saying that's what my. I'm comparing against if, if you flood, if you if you use flooding without causing the server to uh, crash, for example, what you're going to inject is going to be handled by the server. So you don't have a, you don't have this potency. You don't have this multiplicity of effect of a single request. How many requests was this uh, burst? So we injected 800 requests. What is the typical traffic? Uh, typical traffic, uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but it's pretty low, right? Should be pro probably like 0.1 of that. Should be probably like 0.1 of that's one tenth of it, probably like 70, 70 requests a second. Uh, well, I have to add the charts. charts. Uh, Ten times the typical. But these numbers are requests per second, that's 120, 740. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying for utilization to be at 10%, Right, your requests also have to be 10% steady state, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So like 80, 80 requests, I guess. Oh, probably not. Probably. Mm. 
Wow. But this is memory utilization. Did you look at the throughput of the server uh, in the sense that in addition to these, did you look at the throughput of the server in the sense of uh, how, ma how many requests per second are actually being uh, completed? Uh, no, we didn't look at that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that you yeah. I'm pretty sure that you 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 guys worked on says it will allow ninety percent of income in there, right? Allow ninety percent. Ninety percent of I mean yeah. gross, linearly gross, yes. But now uh, but the but the but the But here we started the system admitting everything yeah. everybody. All right. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent will start then go down. Yes. Is this linear drop off or is it like a? It's it's, it's linear. The, the PI is linear. As both both I and B. Yes. Yes. For I and B. Right. Yes. So now what? What? You know, I mean, it doesn't cut off faster. The results will be much better if it cuts off faster. No, I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll tell you why we don't we don't want to cut off faster. The next slide after this. So, so what happens if you have effective feedback delays? So what we did is that instead of using the current utilization uh, to feed it back to the controller, we use something in the past. This could be due to real delay. You know, we have admission control on a separate machine, or due to averaging, like estimated weighted moving average. So we can get up to potency uh, of 15 or 20. So for every request I reject, I inject, I reject 20 requests. And, and when you say 20 requests, are you differentiating between uh, th these 20 requests being some from the no, no, these are 20, no, these are 20 pure for legitimate. 20 legitimate requests. Yes. Uh, it's also important to note some limitations. Pretty bad. Yeah. That's some limitations we had on these experiments. So these experiments were performed on Linux machines and. Linux, it's 2.4 when it's 1. Okay. Uh, Linux eliminates thrashing because it kills threats whenever it realizes that the system is... Because you borrow that from memory. Right. So, uh, so we, we, cannot, we cannot afford to, to have our threats killed because we're collecting data and stuff like this. So we, we, we impose a moderate level of thrash. We don't, we don't want to cause Linux to thrash at the maximum. Uh, but you could borrow that on another resource. Right, yes. Yes. And Linux does this. This is another form of admission control. Uh, no, Linux just has a. It's. If it kills. It's probably late admission control. Yeah, it kills threats. It's a random out of memory kill. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and also there is a limitation on number of open connections that you can generate with HTTP perf. Uh, that's why we use four machines. So uh, we had we had more machines. Probably the damage would be more. You can inject uh, a lot more requests. Just a second on Linux. Yeah. You said Linux eliminates threshing. Does it? When does it Linux kill a thread? It's set. So basically, when, the thread when there is no memory at all. When, when that's it's actually beyond threshing. threshing. It's beyond, yeah. 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 So, so it doesn't, it's not about eliminating threshing. It actually, what it does is it kills threads that, uh, uh, that reach memory exhaustion them. Right. Uh, okay. But this is over a whole system. Over whole system. It's not for specific uh, application that is using memory. Yeah. Yeah. So, the no. results suggest that yeah. K is a key parameter here. Right. Because if you have larger K, this will decrease uh, the impact of rock attacks, as this figure suggests. However, if, if you make K large, then you're going to react very... Yes. K is the, the constant for the PIK. And also, if you have a smaller K, this will make the system more stable. That's true, but it will cause rock attacks so we have more damage. This is K is like a sensitivity parameter, right? Yes. K and also the model of the thrashing index. How, how bad the slope goes down. Uh, the other thing is that if you think about what we used really here is a server that blindly forks requests. So whoever is admitted, is gonna, the server is going to fork a request for it. Uh, so, for example, Apache and uh, probably other web servers, they use uh, a pool of threads. And whenever a request comes, if there is a thread, if the, whenever a request arrives, if there is a pool, uh, thread available, it's going to handle this request. Uh, so, of course, this reduces the impact of rock attacks. Uh, but this also can cause underutilization because if you assume, that you're, you basically have to assume the worst case that you're not going to have more than you know, 500 uh, requests at that point in time.
And this work that tries to... Uh, I don't believe that. Why is that the case? Uh, throughput could be pretty fast, so you can use up all the resources, right? Concurrency doesn't matter. No, what I'm saying is that if you have... Okay, so requests are not usually the same. So you can have, for example, a request for a short page versus a request for a long page. So if you want to have this limited thread pool of, say, 100 threads, and all the requests are very small, then basically you underutilize the system because you can have, you can have a system get more up. You can get more out of this system. But, but those requests also have a potential to get out of the system much faster, right? Uh, so that's true, yeah. But I mean, at some point in time. But you say you get a long request and then you lock down a thread. I believe that. But if you say short request, lock down a thread by the system, I don't know. It doesn't have to be short in terms of time, as maybe it does not require the utilization, but it could take a long time, for example, you know, like uh, CPU utilization. Yeah. It doesn't have to be response time of the request. Uh, and if you, if you have an adapting threat pool, then basically rocks attack are again a threat because you're trying to adapt the pool and rock attacks can force this adaptation to make it harmful. Like right. rock attacks. Yeah. Assume that they understand the period of the system, right? Yeah. System recovery. Yes. This is, uh, this is the main thing. Yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll How does it... Okay, so... Measure that. I was trying to keep this to the end, but... Uh, basically, if, if the attacker is objecting a lot of requests, he's going to get replies. And, and based on this, he can figure out what's the admission ratio. He can probe the server for the feedback delay, uh, how long... Uh, sorry, the settling time, how long does it take the server to settle down? And also for percentage of the admit admission rate. But there's no guarantee that he's going to look at the, he's not going to get rejected this, for the same percentage. I mean, you may apply some randomization law, but I'm saying then, then you're allowing other requests to go through. You're yeah. not completely blocking the server. But if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to present this set of requests and see if 80% of these requests are being rejected, there's no random there. It's all your requests, right? But server may not do it. I mean, you may, you may see other requests that it may reject, then you may not get all the information that you want. Yeah, I, I will not get, probably I will not get every version, but I, I would know more. It's basically a probing mechanism. So, uh, if I send 10 requests and I get 8 replies for it, then probably the admission ratio is 8%. Uh, just what if it's a cluster and I add more servers to this? What happens then? Well, I think you, you, you worked out a D. So you have you worked out the feedback, you worked out everything else for it. When you're doing this, how do you know you're causing enough havoc if I add another server to the cluster? No, okay, so uh, let me understand your question. You talk about setup where you have one admission controller, not yeah, one admission controller, multiple servers on the back, yeah. right? A cluster on so, the back. Yeah. What if you add one more? I mean, let's say you're probing. Yeah. Right? And you figured out that, okay. I'm the attacker and I'm probing. Huh? I'm, I am the attacker. And I'm probing. you're probing, right? right. And you figured out the. The, the, the V, right, which is what it is. Right. Okay. And then you've got the recovery time, and then I add another server to the cluster. Yeah, but... The, what happens then? I, I'm going to figure it out later. Because I'm using a controller. This is online. When you add the server, I'm going to change my values. Continuously monitoring you. Yeah. Maybe we can continue and see the, uh, this impact in okay. the in addition. All right. This the next step slide. So, uh... I'm going to jump to the next part of the talk, which is about congestion controlling networks. So, network adaptation, uh, first part is that any packet loss is considered as a congestion measure, and TCP uses AIMD control. So, basically, if there's no packet loss, it increases its sleep, its sleep linearly by increasing uh, one packet. Packet loss. So, for every act you get, you increase by. It's data packet, by the way. Data packets, yeah. Actually, you really want to lose the acts, and acts do get lost. Yeah, you can lose acts, yeah. But you can lose acts, and they are really good. In TCP, if somebody loses, takes out all the acts, yeah. which are useless, it's great for the system. What do you mean useless? Acts. acts. TCP adjusts the street by acts, adjusts the window by acts. Acts, right. But, but, that, but TCP sends you the, the window change or the, the, the RTD measuring acts only once in... Period, right? No, Not no. every act is useful for that. BSD even, right? No, it, it, it's useful because you don't want to like you don't want to get an act for a whole window of packets. This means that you're through. Correct, correct. But if you lose one, you're talking about one or two packets. I'm talking about data packets here. The sender. Only data. How do you yeah. it from data acts? No, no, no. The, the, there's a connection. There's a sender and there's a receiver. Correct. The 
the data packets are going from the sender to the receiver. The receiver is sending the so X back to the sender. So if you lose X on the other part, you don't care? It's not that you don't care. They have the, you can't lose them all, but if you lose, for example, X for 15 and you get X for 16, oh, well, that's fine. I if you, if you treat them separately. Yeah, here I'm talking about data, loss of data. The ones that would, would generate a dupe pack or at, at the receiver, so it was going to decrease its rate. Okay. So if, if there's a packed loss, the, the, the sender will decrease the rate exponentially fast by having the window every right. uh, loss. And there's also a time out mechanism, so if nothing is going through, TCP shuts off for a period of time. And this is recommended to be one sec. So what generates a loss? Well, if you're using like drop tail, there is no space on the router. If the router is congested and the packet arrives and there's no space on the queue, it, it will get dropped. And there's other techniques that uh, try to signal drops earlier, like red. Red stands for random early drop. And the idea is that idea behind red is that you don't want to keep the flow synchronized. You want to randomize the losses across the flows. Is red? Actually deployed everywhere now? Uh, I thought it's they, not really deployed, they deployed everywhere. somewhere and then they took it out. It, it's, the implementation is there in some routers, but uh, yeah. I, I don't think it's currently deployed. <laughs> well, people have been looking at deploying. E2E recently had a discussion about how stupid red was or something. In that yeah, there is, there is, I'm, I'm just using red as an example. There is many variants of red, S red, B red, and F red. There's a whole bunch of uh, queue management schemes. So I'm going to do the same attack. I'm going to send a burst of packets at a very high rate. And what's going to happen is that this high rate is going to cause buffer overflow. And these packet, some packets will be lost. Uh, so the, the connections will decrease the rate exponentially fast. The packet will shut off for a period of time. Uh, the resource will be underutilized because the connection is now all backed off. So until they increase the, the rate linearly, which uh, is a slow process, uh, the attacker will repeat this again. So I'm using the same uh, 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 rock attack pattern, which is a simple uh, square wave. But this assumes something, right? This assumes that you have, you know, you have uh, the ability to produce the burst in the first place. Right, yes. Or that would mean a 10 gigabit neck or something. Yes, so uh, th that's true. It's, it's a hard problem to flood the, you know, uh, backbone router, for example. Uh, but you can use multiple, so there is two things. You can use multiple, if you have, you know, some worms spreading and you have multiple zombies everywhere, you can uh, basically, you can have enough resources to cause uh, uh, this burst. It's, it's a difficult problem, but but if you think also about, you know, you, you don't have to flood or backbone router, you can just flood somebody, ISP or small link. There's clients now that are connected with one gigabit cards. It's, uh, uh, so the network adaptation uh, model, so we modeled n flows uh, sharing a single bottleneck of capacity C. And here is the block diagram, we have a red controller, uh, besides the loss probability. Uh, loss probability will be seen by TCP, it's going to adjust its rate. However, these rates are going to be added to the attack traffic uh, through the buffer, through the router. And the router is going to have some queue occupancy. This is the current queue size. This queue size will be uh, fed back to red and red would adjust its, uh, its loss probability according to the queue size. Uh, but this system should work if you have what's called a laminar flow, right? If you have no bursts, it should work, right? If you have no bursts, yeah. it should work. Right. What do you mean exactly? It should work meaning it should not stop anybody. It should not stop anybody. anybody. Yeah, there's so red's not throwing anybody out. Any packets out? Yeah. Red is just whenever, so I'll explain how red works in, in a second. Uh, so here is the the buffer, B dot of T. This is how the buffer is changing. It's based on the input rate minus the output rate. So the input rate is coming from the M connection, the summation of M connections, uh, the rate of M connections plus the Y, uh, which is the attack traffic. And these D. These uh, are just delays. On the I'm going to go quickly over the model. Some running out of time. Uh, so red based on the buffer size, it computes an estimated weighted moving average of the average buffer size, and depending on where is the average buffer size, whether it's below B min, which is the minimum threshold, 
it does not impose any losses because between the min and the max it generates a linear uh, it loses as a linear function of v of t and if it's smaller than v max it drops all the factors and one can also model uh, the the change in the uh, rate of each connection x of y of t uh, this is basically the IMD mechanism uh, 1 minus pc pc is the congestion losses 1 minus pc is that if there's no losses you increase linearly if there's losses you increase by because you really right. So uh, we instantiated this model, and this is uh, what I'm showing you here is the numerical uh, results. So on the x-axis there is time, on the y-axis there is the q-size. And the attack would start at time 40. So before the time of the attack, the q-size is stable and everything's nice. Uh, once the, the attack starts, you can see these, uh, uh, the, the q-size basically would hit the maximum causing attack velocity. So here I'm zooming in 15 seconds. Uh, attack period is 5 seconds. You can see that there's a period of underutilization where the Q drains because all the floors backs off. And what's interesting to look at, so these are the connections that I have, my team connections, and this is the attack traffic, and this is the average throughput. What you see is that the average throughput of the attacker is very close to the other users. You cannot distinguish visually that, oh, there's an attack here. So, uh, so how does this model compare to simulation? This is what I'm showing here is simulation using red. So you can see they match pretty well. Uh, of course, since this is a fluid model, we don't have these uh, oscillations. Here. What is the simulation? Sorry? What is the simulation? This is NS simulation. That's what simulates. What was this attack traffic? Did you say that's an average over connection zero? Uh, the attack traffic here? Yeah. It's, it's average over the whole experiment. Okay. Right, so what is your average organization? But you have produced it. Instead of doing constant traffic, you're actually doing bursts. Right. But you have the responsibility to produce bursts. You have the responsibility. If you have any smothers, like routers and anything in between, you're not going to see this, right? This behavior will be very different. This, yeah. is this is at the bottleneck. This is at the bottleneck. True, true. I mean, this, this stays the same, but you must be able to produce the impulse. Right? You're trying right. to you're right. close to the server. You're saying here that you can't identify the attacker? Uh, uh, what I'm saying here is that you cannot identify the attacker at, at, a, at a larger time scale. If you're looking at an average. If you're looking at the average. And usually these are, like, as long as you compute average over uh, periods of time that, that's like around the T, you are not going to see uh, the attack traffic as consuming a lot of resources. But if you look at, of course, if you look at uh, uh, specific, like in the windows of 10 milliseconds, then you might realize, oh, there's a big event. And if you have multiple sources, in order to realize that, you still have to identify, to, to recognize the synchrony between the sources. Because you can't, you don't see the square function, you actually just see the division. Right. The attacker is responsible for giving all, all his packets at one time. Exactly. How do you, if you look as a router, there's no way to do that. Uh, what, why do you, you, you would intersplice inter with other connections, right? Uh, There's no guarantee that you would start sending. I mean, the system sees a burst here, right? Mm -hmm. Because you assume that there is there's this one monolithic burst yeah. from this one connection. Yeah, well, hold on to this. I have some implementation experience. I'll show you this. But just to make sure, to make sure that we. So, the, the pro, the, in order to achieve the attack, mm -hmm. There is a need to have these clients' requests be coordinated so that each client is generating a tiny burst. These bursts have to meet at the same time at the target. Yes, if, 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 this, if, if that's what I want to do, yes. That's so that's what, uh, you know, this to get the square function, function, that's what you have to do, no? Yeah. Uh, is this the, is this yes, the unless, unless there is an attacker who is connected to a very high speed and he can flood the... By himself. Attacker, then he'll by himself. So, for this experiment, I'm using single attack. I'm, I'm not worried about this synchronization of the overlapping bursts of the internet thing. Uh, so, what I'm showing here is this is for red, this is for drop tail. Uh, you can see they're almost uh, the same, except that, of course, drop tail does not try to stabilize the queue. So, it's uh, operating like this. So, now let's compute the damage, which uh, I will instantiate as. Uh, the waste in bandwidth divided by the bandwidth of the attack. And you can see that in the simulations we get up to 8 or 10. 
which means that for every byte I send, I uh, reject eight or ten. What is it for a system that is um, that does not have red? Does not have red? Yeah. It's going to be like say there's no admission that So you can see that here red actually is is worse than drop tail. The potency is uh, uh, sorry, uh, drop tail is, is worse than red. So the system without with admission control or random throwing away of packets is actually better than. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Uh, basically, the, these attack bursts they challenge any any AQM. So any AQM will react as if it's like drop tail because it does not. It, there's no active queue management that would react more quickly than red. Uh, sorry, than than drop tail. Drop tail will. If there is any packet arriving, I'm going to buffer this packet if you have space. Red can drop a packet early. So it could drop the attacker's packets? It can drop the attacker's packets. Is that why it's less effective? Uh, th this could be one reason, yes. No, we are, we are saying that the burst is already into the system. Red is already sent in. Because of the feedback loop delay, Red doesn't know that it needs to throw any other packets. So attacker's packets just go in, smooth, right? The no, if you actually the system. No, that's not. Uh, if if Fred is, for example, imposing uh, one percent loss, this one percent will be across all the flows, including the attack. Right. But why is it even doing a loss, right? Yeah, because it's trying to it's trying to be more smart than drop tail. Uh, so this is the implementation setup we use. We have two servers. Uh, the server actually was somewhere in Italy, across the Benson link, and this server was in our lab. And uh, this is a PC we configured. Wait, where was the first server? In Italy. And we use an attack source and attack sync, and we use three clients. So these three clients will download files from these servers, and then the attack will launch the attack, and the attack will go to the attack sync. So what uh, parts did these attack sources and things have? Oh, so uh, everything was 100 megabits per second except this link, is 10 megabits per second, which is the bottleneck. Uh, but we never injected more than 10 megabits per second from the attack. Why do you really? have a, uh, an attack sync? Uh, yeah, basically, this is the destination where the traffic would go. TCP okay. is So but why, why did you use 10 Mbps there? I mean, why not 100 Mbps? What happens then? Uh, basically, we want to create a bottleneck, sync the bottleneck. So we just use a card that's 10 megabits per second. So, 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 so you need a bottleneck system where yeah, the average utilization has to be really small then, right? Like 4 Mbps or even less. Utilization? 1 Mbps. I mean, meaning on the bottleneck link has to be really low, right? The attack is performed on the bottleneck link. So okay. we have to have a bottleneck link, so... I see, I see, I see. So that's why we decreased the... I see, I see. So here I'm... Uh, what I'm showing on the... X axis is tau, which is the attack period, and here I'm showing the attack. Sorry, here is the uh, how long is the attack burst, and here is how long is the period, and uh, and this is the potency. So you can see you can achieve up to like 12 or 14 of potency. Uh, it's important to see that there is there is other forms of attack called the true attacks which was in SICOM 2003, which basically they target the TCP timeout mechanism. So they send these bursts, but they send them every, for example, every one second, they cause the full timeout, and then they repeat this process. And you can see here the throughput drop from 8 to 1 uh, with 1.5 attack track, which is gives us a potency of 4. However, uh, for rock attacks, the damage may not be as, as much, like the throughput drop from 8 to 3, but with less uh, attack track with only 0.37, giving us potency of uh, 12. So it could be worse because they can be mounted as the civil rock attacks. So if you have the use, if, as we said, if you have multiple uh, uh, zombies, you can cause more damage. Uh, an online control can be used. So basically, in all these terms, I sort of assume that I know when the system would recover, and this leads to a question. But in reality, you can use an online control, for example, to estimate the RTT, to measure the RTT between the attacker and the attack sync, 
And whenever the art piece stabilizes, this means that the attack effect has, has ended. So it should attack again. Uh, this effect is much harder because not just... That, but, but then that's different, right? That's different from saying the first one is a core. Uh, if you go back to these uh, plots... And how, how, how sensitive is that? Oh, sorry. So, for example, here, if you measure the, R the RTT of every packet, in this region, mostly you will see there are very close values. So this means that the system is fine. But once the system is under attack, you can tell you're here or you're somewhere. Basically, it's a correlation between the packets, the RTT of the packets. And the trace back is much harder because not just that you're injecting a, s a small burst, you can also spoof the sources. And moreover, since you're attacking the network link, you can spoof the destination as well. As long as you know that the traffic is routed through this link. So the destination will not exist either. You could do that with traditional service as well, right? Right, yes. It, so the, the main mileage is because you send... Uh, uh, you're basically you're trying to keep a low profile, but you can use also the same techniques to use in the US. Uh, so there's a fundamental trade-offs, again, like we seen of the server part, which is the IMD is trying to achieve fairness. Uh, so it, it makes them vulnerable for rock attacks. For example, if, if you use AIAD or MIMD, added increase, added decrease, or a multiplicative increase, multiplicative decrease, you might reduce the impact of rock attacks, but in the same time you have to give up fairness or um, it remains the question whether there's adaptation mechanisms that are not vulnerable. And you can think also about adaptation, other uh, uh, like uh, other things that rock attacks can, can attack, which is basically load balancers. If you have load balancers, uh, basically how to get them out of synchronization. Think about routing algorithms like BGP, for example. You can do some small change in, in the network and it would cause more adaptation on even outside your AS. So this brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, so this work highlights the importance of examining the dynamics of the system adaptation as possible uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, we introduced the attack potency, which is, describes the marginal utility of attack traffic. And we did this through analysis and uh, numerical solutions, simulations, and uh, real alternate experiments. Uh, and also, I'd like to acknowledge the team for their help with the web server uh, experiments. And this is the URL if you have. Uh, want to look at other work, related work. Have you had any thoughts to how to defend against rock attacks? Uh, basically, it's, it was more like uh, exploring the, the trade-offs between adaptation and uh, being vulnerable for rock attacks. Uh, th there is, we have some ideas, but it's, it's really a hard problem once you think about, for example, in the, in, in the congestion control in the networks. Uh, if every packet has a different source and a different destination, uh, it's going to be very hard for somebody. It, you could, another person could realize that there's a there's tag, but it's very hard to uh, do something about it. Uh, of course, there's ingress and exit token. This could help, but you still can use IP, IPs from, from your domain. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, you. Uh, the, the mission controller in your modeling uh, either rejects requests or delays them. But and you said that you're going to focus in the talk on just rejection. Yes. Have you done any work on delay? Uh, no, I didn't work on postponing requests. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't do any work on, on, on that part. You know, I, one of the things that I'm struggling with here is that initially you presented this concept of elephants on a bridge. Right. And then you said that what if, what if it was just the bridge which is gridlocked? But when I envision this, I still see the need for a bunch of elephants to come stampeding over the bridge just at, at various times. Right? There still has to be some form of elephants to cause this. That's so. Yeah. That's why I just need a few elephants. Okay. That's not all the time. Well, for the second one, would hardly be noticed. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, uh, so if you take a few 
if you have things that can slow down bursts, right? So you're saying the the whole thing here is when you have a spike, it's hard to notice because it's done. And a spike, an impulse in some sense, is shorter than what anybody could more notice and it's smaller than any delay. Right. Any feedback, feedback delay that you can have, an impulse is smaller than that. That's, right. that's the idea here, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you're saying that that drops the synchronization. Right? I mean, I assume that there's, there's a smoother that I employ before I put the system. Right? Assume that, that mission control mm -hmm. also has a smoothing element to it. Okay. So basically, it's a cube. Okay. If I do that, all bursts are smooth. In some sense, you can never produce a burst um, larger than uh, the throughput that I currently do or at max or whatever it is. Like, let's say I found out that from the previous burst, which I suffered, yeah. I know that I cannot render more than this kind of a throughput. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And then I go back and tell that question control player, you know what, don't send me anything at a rate that's faster than this. Uh, the low right? pass right. Yeah, low pass yeah. If you have that, how it because of course it's going to affect the system, yeah, I, I agree. But smooth the right. burst. Yeah. If you smooth the burst, you will be found out. Uh, because all you're doing is injecting from your graph with the blue bar chart versus the yellow one, right? Yeah. You will have a presence right. in the average uh, so, graph right. picture. But right. you will not yeah. have a presence there just due to the timeliness of the burst, right? Right. But if I smooth it out, you will have a presence. You will be found out. Uh, yes, if you, if you smooth it out, that's, yeah, of course, the rocket heads would have less effect. But the problem is that if you smooth them out, also you're, in some sense, you don't want to adapt to, you know, some nature of the traffic. So that's fine. If you don't want to adapt, that's, that's a choice. Uh, uh, let's continue the discussion, but uh, let's now uh, thank the speaker so that we can continue it forward.